was asked by the uh, Marine Study Club at uh, Gajamada University to give a talk on bioinspiration and biomimetics. Uh, unfortunately, I'm on exploration at that time when the talk's meant to be delivered, so I thought I would uh, put a, uh, a real-time video together instead uh, here in Gunung Kidul uh, so that we can all learn together uh, through this video lecture. Okay. So here's how we're going to do it. Uh, we're going to spend some time looking through the day and at night for some organisms and whatever we happen to find, we'll speak about uh, bio-inspiration from the perspective of the particular organism that we find. So we're going to do that today here, but uh, we're heading out to the jungle uh, on Saturday. So I'll do one on Saturday during the day and at night in the jungle as well, so we can get some different kinds of insects and things, maybe some plants. From Bio-inspiration is a generic term that covers many areas such as biomimetics, bio-utility, biotechnology, synthetic biology. Etymologically, biomimetics comes from uh, two Greek words combined. One is bio, meaning life, and mimesis, meaning uh, imitation. So the responsibility of biomimetics in that sense is to mimic nature in some way. The question, of course, then arises, why should we mimic nature? Biological organisms have actually managed to find solutions to problems that we, as human beings, have not managed to find in modern technology. So how do we go about biomimetics or bio-inspired research? In my group, we've divided this into four separate uh, stages, one could say. The first stage is exploration and discovery. And this is quite an enjoyable and fun stage. This is what we're doing now at the moment. And we're here in Indonesia, by the way, because Indonesia is super biodiverse. Once you find a specific organism with a very special feature, then you need to try and understand how that feature actually works. And that is what takes you back to the lab. And that is stage two in our group of biomimetics. You go back to the lab, you start trying to understand how this thing works. Fundamentally, a lot of research will stop at stage two. Stage three involves mi actually mimicking the uh, specific feature in that organism for technological benefit. Now that's kind of difficult because you've got to manufacture, you've got to find a way of manufacturing or processing something, uh, sometimes at a nanoscale or a molecular scale with some level of order that is very difficult to achieve given the kind of uh, equipment we have available at the moment. The final stage is the actual application of your mimicked feature uh, to technology in some way. like this, it's very very difficult to find them. They're always like running under the leaves, taking shelter and so forth. But anyway, this place is beautiful and we're going to keep looking. Alright, have a look around. This web is an incredible example of a super tough material. It can absorb large amounts of mechanical energy. Um, this basically works uh, through protein-protein interactions uh, that are built up of basal amino acid building blocks. Now, we're going to sit down in a minute and uh, write a little bit about, about this. They have actually have around seven different glands. They're split between males and females. Some have three glands, some have four glands. But either way, spiders produce different types of silk. The dragline silks are the, uh, are the very toughest ones. Flagelliform silks are very sticky. They sit around the radial threads. If you focus in on this part of the web here, you see it's scaffolded. Now this is a very interesting feature. Um, some people say it's there to increase the mechanical rigidity of the web itself. Others say it's related to uh, pheromones and, 
and chemical signaling and perhaps even mating. Cut through a cross section of silk you'll find it's a multi-layer structure with a big thick inner core which is essentially the structural part and then outside of that you'll have like uh, some other layers which are related to uh, moisture retention and chemical uh, pheromone signaling and that kind of stuff yeah but really it's this central portion this is the core it's made up of uh, two specific layers this central section is what gives drag line its strength and its uh, stretchability what you have in the center is an elastic portion with lower levels of beta crystallinity and on the outside here you've got a very stiff section with very high levels of beta sheets which form nanocrystals and stiffen up the structure and that of course is very important when it comes to bending if you have uh, a web if you have an insect making impact like this boom with a web yeah then you actually find that it bends and when it bends you'll have an axis of neutrality this is in a state of bending yeah, like so, you'll have a neutral axis right through the center, which is the elastic portion here. And these outer portions here, yeah, the uh, tensile and the compressive faces here, will be what actually uh, give some degree of rigidity and stiffness to that silk. So at the micro level, we already see that silk is uh, optimized for flexional resistance and some degree of malleability within the structure itself. But at a nano level, you'll find things are different. If you were to look through the uh, cross-section, a uh, lengthways axial cross-section of silk, what you'll find is you have an amorphous region, very soft and malleable and elastic region that fills the entire structure. But then within that you will have crystalline, highly crystalline regions of uh, beta sheet nanocrystals. And these essentially reinforce the silk, silk is essentially a composite made up of both hard and soft segments. If you were to take one of these segments over here, for example, and we were to look at it a bit more closely, we would find that uh, we have these beta sheets that are arranged in both parallel and anti parallel forms. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you have parallel beta sheets, you'll have a greater degree of flexibility. You'll have beta strands that are aligned like this, but the hydrogen bonds in between them are happening at angles, yeah? You have angular hydrogen bonding. If you have anti-parallel beta sheets, I'll just do two in this case, the uh, hydrogen bonding is actually uh, normal to the uh, length of the molecular backbone, like that. And what these do is they're, they're a little bit more stiff um, than the parallel form. However, the parallel beta sheets, if they're all parallel, they have a, a slightly more flexibility. Uh, there's, um, it's, qu it's quite unknown as to uh, how, what the percentage of parallel relative to anti-parallel beta sheets are in silk. However, there seems to be growing, uh, a growing trend towards the idea that uh, parallel beta sheets are actually dominating in spider silk. In Bombix Mori silks, which are not as tough as, um, as spider silks, we're talking a difference of 150 megajoules per cubic meter in uh, spider silks and around 70 to 80 megajoules per cubic meter uh, in Bombix Mori, Bombix Mori silks. Uh, in those, the ratio of uh, parallel to anti-parallel seems to be 1 to 2 or 1 to 3, according to some different sources. Yeah. Now hydrogen bonds by themselves are not actually very strong. They're much, much weaker than covalent bonds. A carbon-carbon bond could be around uh, 350 kilocalories per, per mole, whereas a hydrogen bond would be looking at 5 to 20 kilocalories per mole, unless it's a fluorine-based hydrogen bond, which is much, much stronger. We're talking about 150 kilocalories per mole there. But when you have these hydrogen bonds connecting together, yeah, parallel strands, yeah, beta strands, that are then woven in a large tight matrix you actually have a highly energy absorbing system which will also self heal because if these start shearing if these bonds start breaking because this will move this way and this will move this way which will happen under mechanical deformation 
then of course what will happen is that the bond will reform if it's slow enough further up the line. So you have a state of self-healing in spider silk as well, which is again another reason for why it uh, has very large mechanical absorptive capabilities. Another issue is that the, these beta sheets are flexible. They're not completely rigid. If you have a very, very rigid system, you'll have a large energy differential at the interface, which means that, you know, you will initiate fracture more easily. But uh, in spider silk, the beta sheets, the nanocrystals, they have some degree of flexibility, which therefore allows them to retain their structure, even under deformation, without breaking the hydrogen bonds too early. Okay? Now, what is amazing about this silk, these silks, yeah, whether they're Bombix Mori silks, but they're also amazing, or spider silks, is the fact that these are made up of biopolymers. They are protein-based materials. They are pretty much, the drag line itself, the structural component of drag line is all pretty much now protein. Now, if we are able to manufacture uh, polymers artificially or, or other materials artificially with uh, internal structural components that mimic that of silk, then maybe we can also raise the uh, toughness and mechanical energy absorptive capabilities of uh, modern man-made materials. Another thing I'm going to speak about now with respect to silks involves their capture success because there is recent research that shows that if the electrostatic uh, force, the electrical conductive forces from incoming insects if this is your silk strand here if you have an incoming insect it will actually attract the silk towards it so this silk will actually bulge out and connect and literally grab the insect so it's almost like it's a living thing now some research we did ourselves uh, uh, on this phenomenon at the molecular level which is different from the uh, the first paper that was out on this at the molecular level what we've discovered is that the silk will actually self toughen uh, before it uh, bulges out and captures the uh, the prey You don't even have to look far to start discovering really amazing examples of, uh, of uh, organisms that we can mimic features from. Okay, so this here, this is a decorated crab. What yeah? we have here with the crab is uh, a good example of layer by layer deposition and self-assembly. What does that mean? If you imagine the uh, crab is a soft-bodied creature and its cells will uh, exude biominerals to create its shell and they will do that layer by layer so if you imagine it exudes the first layer like so it will then continue the cells will continue to uh, produce these biominerals and you will have this uh, very finely layered structure which uh, will essentially uh, retard crack growth if I zoom in on this pull it out here what you'll have is a layered like structure and if a fracture comes like this in this direction rather than being a through fracture coming right the way through it will come to the first layer and then the energy will dissipate across that layer and at some point it'll find a weak spot and it will continue its journey down but then it might send the energy in a different direction at some point it might find another weak spot and it'll come down but you can imagine a system like this is going to be much much harder to fracture and break than a system which is just a single layer where a single brittle biomineral layer which will if you put a fracture through it it will just come right through at high speed got to be a little bit careful and handling these. Have a look at that. Oh. Yeah, he's really quite angry, this guy. See that? Wow. He's soon coming out, but we're not going to let him. I'll let him be free. Ready? When it comes to uh, sea snails, you do find a particular type uh, known as the pteropod. 
Uh, pteropods, their shells are very interesting, uh, a very interesting case of biomineralization. If you imagine, uh, ordinarily you might have a layer by layer, like with the crab, uh, means of deposition of your biominerals and so forth. Like this, yeah, you might have a platelet form like exists, like you find in the abalone shell, yeah. But with the pteropod, they take things one step further, and the abalone does this too in its own way. Uh, the pteropod will actually have T shaped interlocks. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means, of course, that if you are trying to shear across here and cause a slippage in this plate, you actually have to break this lump of biomineral first before you can do that. The real challenge lies in managing to uh, reproduce the uh, these nano protubering features that actually cause an improvement in shear interlocking and that's something that hasn't really been done very successfully. Some people use atomic layer deposition methods, some people atomic layer deposition methods, some people will use layer by layer methods uh, similar in essence to what the crab will do with its shell but these are very very slow uh, methods for developing layered structures and in that sense, they're not very practical from an industrial point of view. So while it's been raining here today, we haven't seen so many insects actually. We have had some close encounters with some aggressive monkeys nevertheless. But uh, what we have seen are a lot of butterflies flying around. So what's going on there? How come they don't just sink to the ground when the water hits their wings? Well. It's quite well known that uh, bl uh, butterflies, by and large, will be iridescent. They will have like this very beautiful glow that comes from the surface of their skin. And that's, you know, the iridesc iridescence itself is uh, down to a, a phase change, yeah? An out of phase beam of light that will um, come a little bit later than the first beam, which reflects off the very first surface the second beam will actually diffract within the second surface and then come and out. And this can be through the medium of chitin mirrors or it can be diffraction gratings. But if we think about diffraction gratings, diffraction gratings are actually nanoscale protuberant features that might look something like this. Yeah? There are many different variations. Yeah? But they will look like this essentially, sim in, in the simplest possible form. And what that does is it will create a certain, uh, a certain sort of gap distance that will prevent um, fluids from imbibing. The surface tension of the fluid will be high enough, in this case water, be high enough to actually allow the uh, droplet to sit on the surface of the, um, of the butterfly wing. Which means, of course, that if we take this to a larger scale and we draw the butterfly wing here like that, you got a, your pretend eyes that's you know sticking out like so, and we have the droplet come on the surface rather than it soaking into the surface and then filling these as pores, it will just roll off, roll off the surface and off the wing. That also means that the uh, butterfly wing will self-clean. How does that happen? Well, if you have a surface like this and you've got your little protuberant nano features on the surface. If you have some dirt on the top of your wing, it's getting hard to write because it's raining so much, sorry. Then when you have your droplet like this, it'll roll off and it'll collect the dirt as it rolls off. So then the dirt comes off the wing. And that's how the butterfly wings are iridescent and the same features will give rise to uh, super hydrophobicity. And that same concept will give rise to a self-cleaning surface. How does this bear any effect in terms of bio-inspiration and biomimetics. Well, self-cleaning windows could be useful. Self-cleaning cars would be really awesome. I would love that. Uh, what about controlled imbibition and controlled surface wetting characteristics? For example, with printing inks and that kind of stuff. So there are many potential applications for self-cleaning, super hydrophobicity, 
and uh, you know the diffraction gratings the I, I guess one could say that one primary use is uh, in terms of uh, the way light is diffracted and then deflected but uh, that also controls heat so the heat levels can be controlled through these same kinds of diffraction gratings and uh, chitin mirrors so if we can mimic those we can have really interesting and functional surface properties for modern man-made materials. This is a Sidorestrian coral and uh, each of the polyps is quite tightly packed in what appears to be a hexagonal packing arrangement and the uh, hexagonal packing arrangement is uh, the, probably the tightest packing arrangement that you can get. Now another important and interesting feature here is that you'll find they have their seti that will come across and further reinforce the uh, each polyp wall. Nature is, is art, right? So how can we uh, use something like this? How can we uh, enjoy the benefits from mimicking something like a Sidorastrian coral? Well, given its lightweight to high strength ratio, perhaps functional yet uh, well designed and aesthetically pleasing architectures is uh, one possibility. Okay, so we've been here for a while. We've come to four different spots in this jungle and uh, we haven't got anything yet, mostly because it's been raining on us quite continuously. However, luckily for us, we have had uh, many, many fireflies to look at and they're really beautiful and they look, they really do look like fairies just prancing around in the jungle. It's wonderful. Um, we are also though, unfortunately, have a bunch of monkeys who are following us. All right, guys, this is the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something about bioinspiration and biomimetics. I apologize again that I can't be there in person. Uh, I hope your event goes really well. Uh, the important thing to remember with all of this is that you're having fun and that you don't take yourself too seriously. Because when you take yourself too seriously, you suck the fun out of everything. And the best research is always happening when you're having the most fun. You will find, I mean, sorry, stop. Buy a minute, uh, stop. But the bit, but sorry. You'll find these in every country and on every continent. Yeah, except Antarctica. Ah, I hate speaking to a camera! A philosophical interlude. You don't see rocks loving rocks, do you? Therefore, love is also bio inspired. And you pretty much find every organism under the sun, except for the ones that are in brackish water or in the north, uh, like polar bears. Anyway! <laughs> This is how you capture a butterfly. Take the flower posture and then you bait them in with these. Yeah, good thing about this method, if your nose becomes itchy, you can also take a time out from capturing the butterfly just to itch your nose and you go back to it. What am I doing in here? Just if you finish it. Yep. Stop, I will stop it and focus on the spider. Yep, just come down now. Your ready? See you later. So there it is, come down there. Okay, ready? Yep. One, two, three. Wait, one, two, three. But the very best thing about the Sidorastrian coral is not in biomimetics or in bioinspiration, but rather in biotility, because I've discovered that they can be used as a good foot scraper as well. There you go. Nice one. Feeling smooth and baby-like already. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, baby. Yeehaw.